This podcast is CME eligible. To learn more and claim credit, go to the CME tab on the Jerry Powell website. And Alex, there's something else special coming up. Our 300th anniversary episode is coming up. 300 podcasts. Can you believe it? We've done many songs. We have many laughs, many tears. I don't know about tears. Anyway, we would love to have your questions. What are we doing for our 300th podcast I think here? We're doing an AMA. Ask me anything. So you send us questions. We will answer any and all of them as much as we can get to on the 300th episode podcast. You could ask us questions about studies that we've talked about, about fields, about our opinions about topics. You know, we have many guests on. You don't get to hear from us as much. You could what ask us. our most memorable podcasts? Yeah. What it takes to be a podcaster and why we do this. Or anything else that comes to your mind, just send the answer or the questions. We will do the answers on the AMA podcast. So send it to eric.wadera at ucsf.edu. That's eric.wadera at ucsf.edu. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Wadera. This is Alex Smith. <laughs> wait, wait, Alex, uh, is this a coup? Uh, are you, do you have a new co-host? That's right. Ashwin is taking your place and you're now remote. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, uh, maybe we should talk after this podcast about what's happening here. Uh, but we do. We have a great topic today. We're going to be talking about default palliative care, a new article that just came out in JAMA this week, co-paired with another article that was published that we did a podcast on last week. Alex, who are our guests today? We're delighted to welcome some repeat guests. Scott Halpern, who's a pulmonary and critical care physician, researcher, and director of the PEAR Center at the University of Pennsylvania. And PEAR stands for the Palliative and Advanced Illness Research Center. Scott, welcome back to Jerry Pal. Pleasure to be here. And we're delighted to welcome Kate Courtright, who's a pulmonary and critical care and palliative care physician researcher, also a core faculty member at the Pear Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Kate, welcome back to Jerry Powell. Thank you. Good to see you. And as mentioned earlier, Ashwin Kotwal is joining us as a guest host. He's a geriatrician and palliative care doc researcher in the UCSF Division of Geriatrics. Ashwin, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Guest host makes me feel a little bit better since I'm not in the room. <laughs> better title. Scott, I think you have a song request before we talk about the JAMA piece and default palliative care. What is the song request? I would ask that Alex finally consider after all these years a song <laughs> by the best band in the world, Fish, <laughs> and specifically the song Miss You. Yeah. And why this song? A uh, couple reasons. So Trey Anastasio, the lead singer, wrote this song about his sister, Christy, when she died about a decade ago. And that was a couple years after my father died. And when I first mm -hmm. heard the song live, I I was a pool of tears. Um, and it, it just hits me that way. And of course, this is what families of patients undergoing palliative care go through. Um, but I also think there's like a cool connection to this study in particular. So Alex, imagine you're a seriously ill hospitalized patient and I'm your doctor, unluck unluckily for you. Um, but <laughs> potentially, fortunately for you, Kate is the palliative care clinician who's on service. Absent a default order for palliative care consultation, your myopic doctor, me, might not think to get that you would benefit from palliative care. And so- You might Kate miss me? would miss you. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's Kate would miss me. Yeah. Indeed I would. Oh, that's good. <laughs> and how many fish shows have you been to, Scott? Uh, about a hundred. That's amazing. Wow. That is amazing. Well, this is yeah. a beautiful, wistful, melancholy tune. I'm still in a splint, so I'm gonna play it with two fingers. Here's a little bit of it. smiling at me from your picture frame and I miss you my life keeps on changing but you stay the same and I miss you
so many moments that we should have shared. I miss you. The days turn to years, and it hasn't stopped yet. The memories we shared, I will never forget. That was lovely, Alex. Scott, I got a question. Uh, I recently learned about something called Parrot Heads because we had a Jimmy Buffett song. Uh, who was that requested by again, Alex? That was a the Doula podcast, which oh, will be released later. Uh, Death Doulas. And I know about Dead Heads. Is there is there Fish Heads? Fish Fans. Oh, Fish PH. Fans. Yeah. A little bit better than Fish Heads. Yeah. And the best shows are always on Sundays. So it becomes Sunday fun day, also with a PH. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for the song. Okay, Kate, I'm going to jump to you. I think the last time we had you on was 2022. Uh, and Sounds right. I remember in particular, one of the things you said is that, uh, you know, we've had this explosive growth in inpatient palliative care, but the large majority of evidence that we've had for palliative care really comes from outpatient settings. This study, again, we'll have a link to it in our show notes, so this JAMA study, you kind of went from zero to not even 100, like 1,000. This is 24,000 encounters, over 15,000 patients, 11 hospitals, eight states. Uh, why did you decide to do this study? And... Like, I'm still trying to grasp my head about how big this is the largest palliative care study uh, by far we've ever had. You could probably tally up all the other patients. You'd probably come to not even 15,000 patients, unique patients. Um, I mean, the short answer is go big or go home, right? And um, <laughs> b before we started recording, you asked me what race I was going to run, and it was either another 50 mile or a 12 hour timed race. So, like, this must be my personality. I just go for the gusto. Um, I, I think the long answer is that it was intentionally designed as a pragmatic trial in which um, we wanted to roll this out in that kind of setting. Many hospitals um, that look different from each other that are different in geography and then um, inclusive of populations of patients that have prevalent diseases that um, often are underrepresented in palliative care studies. Admittedly, we um, used historical samples to project what our sample size would be, and we underestimated a little um, because that's a challenge um, in these studies. But but that's, that's really the upshot. Scott may have sort of additional commentary there, but... What do you think, Scott? You're, I mean, you're right, Eric. I, 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 my sense is if you add all the palliative care RCTs that have been done to date, you wouldn't get a sample size that equals this. And importantly, almost all the ones that have been done were with consent. So people had a consent to be in. And that's often ethically not only appropriate, but like required. Yeah. But 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 in minimal risk studies, it doesn't have to be that way. And uh, the virtue of not having a uh, consent approach is you get all comers and there's no selection effects. So that's like a, a totally differentiating feature. But what we really were after is how do we understand in an experimental way whether inpatient palliative care affects certain outcomes? We can't randomize people to get inpatient palliative care or not. Like no one, no IRB is going to approve that. And I mean, I couldn't live with myself, but we can randomize whether an intervention that increases the probability of palliative care delivery is or is not administered to a given patient. So that's what we did. So that's the way to get at experimentally what previously had been based in just observational data, this whole notion that palli inpatient palliative care reduces length of stay. Do we, do we know that that's true? Well, we need to find out. Yeah. Uh, a, a couple words that I heard come up to just from my own memory, because I know, uh, Kate, when you were last on, we talked about like 
pragmatic trials. Like, what is a pragmatic trial? You mentioned this was a pragmatic trial. Just in like a sentence or two, what do you mean by pragmatic trial? I mean that it is a reasonable alternative to what's happening in usual care. And it is embedded or in, or sort of rolled out into routine practice that's already happening. And you aren't um, requiring people to administer, be part of, enroll, recruit, do all the things. And that your outcomes are pragmatically captured from data that exists. That's sort of the far end of the pragmatic spectrum. But it is a spectrum. I think we talked about that on the last podcast. Yeah. So you're, you're already thinking about how do I, like, is this implementable in, is that even a word, in, in practices in hospitals that are not just these 11 hospitals? By and large, your goal would be yeah. to make it as generalizable as possible within the confines of how different hospital A, B, and C are, even yeah. when you try to make it as diverse of an environment. And Cass, one more question. I know I got a bunch of researchers with me. I read one sentence and said a pragmatic step wedge cluster randomized trial. I, I think I got three of those words. Uh, step wedged cluster. What is that and why did you decide to do a stepped wedge cluster? You want to take that one, Scott, or was that to me? Uh, either. <laughs> I, I'm good. Go for it. Uh, okay. Stepped wedge is it's easier with a visual, but simply means that uh, at its core with two groups that every hospital in our case starts in routine care or whatever the usual care definition is and will ultimately in a randomized fashion transition to adopt the intervention in steps meaning over time and so for us it was a two to three month step um forget 2.7 months excuse me and so that everybody by the end of the trial has the intervention and is in the intervention phase if you will or period there are virtues, um, you didn't ask me this, but there are virtues and drawbacks to that um, in contrast to what might be more familiar to people, which is a parallel trial in which you would just assign half the hospitals to receive, to keep usual care in our case, or half the hospitals randomly assigned to adopt the default order. And then the cluster part is simply that we that's our randomization unit. And for us, it was a hospital. And again, for a number of reasons, but you could have clustering um, in within clinics, clustering on uh, within clinicians who care for a panel of patients, that sort of thing. So you're not randomizing the patient, you're randomizing kind of when they adopt the intervention, which is the default order over time. When the, when hospital. the hospital does. Yeah. When the hospital does, yeah. And, and, and Kate, was there, was there, any blinding to this for the teams? Like, did they did they know that these orders were going to be put in into place eventually, or um, and, and did they kind of work with you all in, in thinking about the timing, or was that completely random? Well, so the hospital assignment as to when they transition um, on a calendar day is is randomly assigned, so they didn't get a choice about that. But um, for I think obvious reasons, clinicians were not blinded, palliative care teams were not blinded um, because one, we needed to engage them as stakeholders um, for this big change in, um, in to their workflow or hospital and, and volume as I'm sure we'll get into. And then um, clinicians who are receiving the default orders certainly were not blinded because they could see them <laughs> appear. Um, so yes, that is, that is true. That seems more pragmatic too, that you'd want them to be aware that, you know, their workload is going to change. And it sounds like maybe they even made some changes um, in response or to prepare for that. Yeah, we, we neither encouraged nor prohibited them from making changes, like consistent with the pragmatic, pragmatic nature. Some did, some didn't. The big changes that were made were not big and not sustained in a lot of cases. But what, just, what do you mean by not sustained? Well, you know, you add a FTE for a year and then it's gone yeah. the next Oof. year. And this was done pre-COVID, right? This mm -hmm. was, yes. <laughs> uh, so this was a, this was a, a, was a, a lifetime's worth of work. Um, and, you know, going back to like when I was shopping this idea around to health systems in 2012, we landed on the stepped wedge design because no one was, you know, I said before, you couldn't randomize people to get palliative care or not. Yeah. You know, specifically, like you can't say, you know, you, Alex yeah. Smith, prohibited from getting palliative care. You can't do that. 
we couldn't even get hospitals to say, oh, the default palliative care? Yeah, let's do that. We don't want to be in the placebo arm or usual care arm. So we had to pick a design where everyone ultimately got something to get buy-in in the first place. It also feels like it covers kind of two questions. Is One is, d- does creating default orders, it could be any default order, change the number of like outcomes, so in this case, consultations? And then the second is, does, does that result for palliative care in any important outcomes? Two really interesting questions. One is about like this nudge. Like, would you consider this a behavioral economics intervention? A nudge towards a particular pushing people towards something, in this case, a palliative care consult? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We're making it easier to do the thing we thought that they ought to be doing. You know, and a all little the- harder, right? Not to do it because now it requires another step right. to, to cancel the consult. Yes. So I think it's fair to say that it was no harder to cancel the consult than it would be to order a consult under normal conditions. Yeah. So we're just flipping the switch from what happens absent that same level of effort. Beautiful. Well, let's let's talk about that. Like we're, let's dive into what the intervention is. What was the nudge? Before we talk about the nudge, interesting you included People 65 and older with COPD, pulmonary, uh, COPD, dementia, or kidney disease. Why those three? I'm going to turn to you, Scott, for this one. Well, at the time that we did this study, and I think it's still f- true today, um, maybe with one exception being dementia, um, but in, in general, at the time we did this study, nearly all, if not all, palliative care studies had been done in cancer or, and or heart failure. Um, So we wanted to expand the evidence base. So we picked three diseases that consensus criteria at the time had recommended uh, inpatient palliative care consultation for patients with dementia, COPD, and end-stage renal disease who also meet these certain other criteria. Like they have to, it's not all comers with those diseases. It's people who are particularly sick. So COPD was two hospitalizations less, or oxygen, two hospitalizations less, 12 months, or oxygen, uh, dialysis for kidney failure, and coming in from a long-term care facility or it has a a peg tube or two hospitalizations the past 12 months for dementia. So those were the three. It's like you read the I got it right in front of me, Scott. (laughs) Right in front of me. I shouldn't say that. That was purely from my memory, (laughs) listeners. I am that good. Nailed it. Uh, yeah, exactly. So wanted to assess, like, do these people benefit? Yeah. The other thing, though, is we never would have gotten this past go uh, with a health system if we included everyone, right? Because yeah. then think about what the response of the palliative care teams would be. Oh, we've got to now we're getting defaulted to see everyone with cancer and everyone with heart failure and all these other groups. Like, no way, not sustainable. And related to that, when we designed the study, we said it was going to be everyone 45 and older. But we did a, a pilot year. And when we counted the numbers, that was total. All the palliative care teams were like, uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how we wound up at 65. All right. And then, Kate, what was the the nudge itself? So we talked a little bit about it was as a default. Can you explain what actually happened? Sure. So when patients were uh, identified as eligible um, through this EHR algorithm and some nurse EHR input, um, if needed, they were automatically enrolled. And um, on if they were in the intervention phase, the hospital on. Um, 2 p.m. on hospital day two, um, basically the system was programmed to create a palliative care consult order that then triggered an alert to the attending clinician that said this patient has COPD with two hospitalizations, like what, how they met the criteria. Um, A palliative care consult has been ordered. If you do not wish to have that, go here to cancel it. Like we tried to make it, you're not trying to hide that they can cancel it. That alert occurred um, for 24 hours um, to enable them an opportunity because that happens when they log into the chart to enable sufficient opportunity to truly opt out if they, um, and to know about it. Um, And the 
consul act remained inactive or pended, if you will, at, for that whole time. And so then it wasn't until hospital day three at 2 p.m. when it would become active and then go through whatever process that hospital's palliative care team took in consults. It's now going through that routine process. Like a couple of questions on that. Uh, first, uh, I did ask Twitter, uh, did they have any questions about this? And, and Anil uh, Makem asked one question about the trigger. Is how much effort did it take for each hospital's IT infrastructure for automated identification, randomization, and alert? Like, was this like a huge heavy lift or was it pretty easy to, to create this trigger? This is where maybe that bottle of alcohol is needed. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, Enough it's said. A, it's, no, no, it's, it's a tough answer um, in part yeah. because, um, uh, as Scott mentioned, you know, this was being implemented somewhere in the 2014 15 range after funding and, and building um, in that pilot year. And I think it's fair to say that health systems, even IT and EHR infrastructures, are, are already different um, and they're better. They're more streamlined. People have the same platform across all their hospitals or are trying to move to that. And so for this trial, and this was also like, less, this is a big lesson learned for us. Like this trial, what was challenging about the IT builds, I believe, was a little less about actually doing the work once we sort of understood what the work needed to be. But the fact that um, although all used a um, the same EHR in name, um, they all had actually different instances of that EHR. So there was duplicative effort required because of that, which is a health system specific issue that, mm -hmm. frankly, as early prag trialists we didn't even know to ask yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> so um you know and and i think that 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 is a challenge um but our having learned that and now knowing the language to speak better to it and is folks about what we're looking for what we need not allowing assumptions you know we just i think we understand better how to partner and make that a more efficient process but i don't want to pretend that these builds happen overnight or nor should they they do yeah. require piloting and 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 whatnot um so it looks easy and it, once it's implemented because it just kind of happens but a lot of work goes into it yeah i got, I got another question so you, you get the nudge it pushes this this default order like in a non-pragmatic trial like palliative care team is going to see everybody right like you've created increased infrastructure it's part of like do i want to know this palliative care work you didn't do that here. It's a pragmatic study. A lot of these teams look the same. You know, if the workload is going to increase, their team size is going to be the same. Could the palliative care team opt out of seeing somebody or maybe nudge the 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 primary team? Like, do you think really that palliative care needs to be seen here? Because I did hear from another colleague, I won't mention the name, that as a fellow, they had like these auto triggers. And that's what you know, they would call up the primary team, they'd talk about the case, and they'd say, you know what, maybe you could just do this, or, you know, maybe they could be seen by outpatient palliative care instead. Yeah, for, for sure. I mean, we, we, we planned on this. Um, you know, we powered the study with an estimate that uh, we'd increase the proportion of patients seen by palliative care uh, by around 30%. And we estimated that the baseline would be somewhere in the range of, you know, 10%. So it turned out the baseline was about 16%. And indeed, it went up by about 30%. That was, that was the whole idea. There was no way we ever imagined or even wanted, for that matter, everyone meeting these criteria to be seen by the palliative care team under the intervention. That, that, that's not a sustainable thing. That, that, and, and the goal isn't... It's not just that the goal was not to have the best be the enemy of the good. It's actually that we didn't know, and, and and we still don't know, and I think it's probably not true, that having all of those people seen by palliative care specialists would even be the best. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to move on. Unless, Ashwin, you have uh, any other questions as our guest host? I have so many questions. I mean, what one is related to, and this might be jumping ahead a little bit, but I, I'm don't go to results yet because I got to oh, ask what the outcomes. Okay. <laughs> All right, let me pause there. Yeah, let's we got to get to outcomes. outcomes. Let's not bury first. the yeah. lead. Let's okay, talk yeah, about let's it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm, I got one big question <laughs> on outcome. Why length of stay? You know, I'm gonna ask this question. Why did you pick length of stay 
as the primary outcome. All right, I'll take it. <laughs> Look, the, at the time that we wrote this grant, the whole f- business model of pa- inpatient palliative care was predicated on reduction in stay. stay. Yeah. That's what utilization, it was. Utilization, utilization, utilization. We may not think that it's the ideal outcome measure. And and Kate and I have sworn that we will never design another trial where length uh-huh. of stay is the primary <laughs> outcome, for sure. But that's what the business model of inpatient palliative care was predicated on. And hence, that was the outcome that is responsive to health system decisions about whether they're going to up or down staff palliative care teams. I, I, I completely agree. I think it is an important outcome for stakeholders. It is probably the primary reason why palliative care and in hospitals just took off much more mm-hmm. than outpatient palliative care, where we have a lot more evidence. Yep. But yep. I'm going to push back a little bit. You did something a little funky with length of stay, right? So uh, you coded deaths as the like the 99th percentile, right, of longest length of stay. Which is interesting because that's something the hospitals don't care about. Uh, so if you have like say uh, you know two similar patients who go to the ICU with COPD, both are on a vent. One lives for 27 days and dies in the ICU. The other one gets a palliative care consult yeah. and dies four days from hospital admission. In reality, that is a huge cost saving for the hospital. But for this primary outcome with this funky code, um, it makes it look like they had the exact same length of stay. Yeah. I, and I know you don't want to get into the weeds of the stats here, yeah. or, um, but I, I'll just say two things. First of all, we did analyze it the conventional way also, and the result is exactly the same. Right, you just so, blew my, my, <laughs> my pieces out of the water. Yeah. So sorry. Like this is a no overall finding on length of stay and analyzed in 17 different ways with or without death being ranked. But, but the, the reason that our primary approach ranked it is because every other approach to analyzing length of stay data is wrong, (laughs) statistically wrong, (laughs) because it suffers from an informative censoring problem. You don't know what the length of stay would have been had it not been for the death. And and I, literally, I mean, there's dozens of stats, we, weedy stats papers on but this. I am not a statistician, but I would push back. Like, if fundamentally the question is, like, I am making a business case to the hospital and I'm going to be using this paper, I am not going to be using a you know a length of stay coded to the, the 99th percentile. I'm going to be using, I just want the plain length of stay data. I know, I know. And that we're researchers for everyone, right? That's why we did it the other way, too. So we can do the scientifically correct thing, and we can do the thing that you, Eric, as the CEO... As the non-scientifically scenario. correct person. Yeah, we, we, can, we can make everyone happy. <laughs> oh, yeah, Ashwin. I think I'm done. You can jump to the results now. Yeah. Well, you know, related to this length of stay argument... Um, you all did try to, you know, uh, look at people who receive treatment that comply or average treatment effect, um, and found a massive difference in the length of stay. And you know, when when we were reading it, we we were thinking, is just is this just a per protocol analysis on steroids? Is this just a signal? You know, how should we be interpreting that result? And um, and you know. And- for the listeners who may have not read the study, I'm just going to, Scott already threw out the, the result of no change in length of stay in primary outcome and multiple sensitivity analysis for the default versus non-default palliative care. But Ashwin's bringing up this, what was it Kate analysis? The Kate um, analysis. Looking specifically at Scott, is that at uh, folks who actually got the intervention? Or not the intervention, everybody got the default intervention. Yeah. Um, so, so, so this is a this is a analytic technique that comes from uh, economists, and it's it's based on an instrumental variable, uh, which we don't need to get into the weeds. In, uh, but it's it's very goodness. much not a per protocol analysis. So a per, per, per protocol analysis would say like these are the people who got palliative care, and these are the people who didn't, and we're going to compare their outcomes. 
Right. Um, it's it's like last time I was on with you guys, we were talking about the the state of science at Pulse. Like all Pulse studies do that. Like these are the people who complete Pulse. These are the people like huge confounding. Like these right. people just don't like these people. So yeah. it's 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 flawed on its face. Yeah. What a Kate analysis does is basically um, infers using all of the data, no one's excluded, of the people who only would have gotten the intervention had they by chance been randomized to the intervention group, what was the effect on their length of stay of having gotten it or not. So so it's not all the people who got it. It's of the people who only would have gotten it if they were assigned to the intervention, what did the intervention do to them? And as Ashwin mentioned, it was a pretty big reduction. Huh. That is fast. I think we probably have a whole nother talk about that analysis. Ashwin, anything else about that you want to bring up? I, I, I am curious, you know, what that, what that means. Like, is that, um, is that a result of palliative care teams being really good at knowing who to see? Um, is it, you know, a function of, you know, the, these default orders being in place for a certain period of time and people kind of getting used to it? Like how, how do you all interpret that, fi that finding? It, should we say for the listeners who may not have read the study that of those who were assigned the default palliative care orders, I think about 45% had the consult, right. about 10% of cases, the primary team canceled the consult, and the other 45% of cases, the patients were not seen by palliative care. Right. Just want to make sure that's clear. Correct. I just, um, I don't know that I'm going to directly answer your question with this, Ashwin, but I just want to mention that because we brought it up earlier that um, the palliative care teams indeed to, to some extent, um, did select sort of who they were going to see mm -hmm. through all different means. And, and that's because, as Scott mentioned, we didn't tell them how to handle their that excess volume or what to do with it. We really worked with them to do what was most comfortable within their usual workflow. If they had a busy day before this trial started, what did they do? Did they call the teams? Did they screen charts? Did they just do first come, first serve? And like, encourage them to continue whatever practice was most um, working for them. Um, so, so we know that probably there were selections going on as to who was going to be seen or prioritized or triaged. We don't necessarily systematically know how, um, and that's okay. Uh, but it, it gets at that issue of, um, you know, how much of this was driven by um, intentional selection when when 10 came in and two were seen, or I guess it would be <laughs> one canceled, four seen. And, uh, but, but then the other issue is, um, you know, you want to believe that sort of in a really simplified, that Scott might get mad at me for saying, but like a really simplified takeaway is simply that, and what we were trying to get at is the idea that if delivered, yeah. if palliative care is indeed delivered, that mm -hmm. outcomes move. But when you have half of those accepted default orders not seen for all sorts of reasons, mm -hmm. you know, discharge, died, or or no, just no time, or what have you, or triaged, um, not to, um, and half are seen, comes out in the wash as null. And so we really were mm -hmm. trying to get at that in a more robust statistical way than a per protocol analysis, which is mm -hmm. inherently flawed as we've talked about. And it also seems like while the primary outcome was, was null, uh, there were some other important outcomes, including the fact that your intervention, the default orders increased consultations by a lot, like 40 something percent versus 16%, uh, decreased time to consultations by a day, which is pretty huge, especially I don't know what the median length of stay is, but it's usually not too long in the hospital. And you had higher rates of hospice discharges, higher rates of DNR orders. So a, a lot of results kind of kind of coming in when you think about you d do these default orders for palliative care. What kind of impact should we be seeing from them? Now, can I turn to Ashwin? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I read your editorial, Ashwin. So Ashwin and Alex and... Lauren Hunt. Uh, Lauren Hunt did an editorial together. Uh, and one of them is, uh, one of the statements struck me is, Ashwin, you said in the editorial that uh, palliative care teams are probably both 
what, what, relieved? Yeah, a, a mixed emotions with us there. You remember the line? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when we were reading through the article, we, we kind of put ourselves in the place of palliative care teams that might be, you know, uh, about to have a default order that dramatically increases the number of people we see. And, you know, I... I you know, I'm on service right now. It, it can get really busy. We spend a lot of time with every consult that we see. I remember as a fellow, some days struggling to even get out of the team room because you're getting paid so much um, and and doing a lot of triage on on who to to see. And so, you know, this idea of increasing the number of consults with the same team, you know, the same resources, I, I think it gave me a little bit of a uh, a little bit of pause. And so, yeah, I'm curious also, Alex, what, what you think. Um, the, I, I think for me, I wondered if there might be some flexibility in the default order, you know, that, that there's a different threshold you use for the default order to make it sustainable. You know, that it, it invites so many other questions about how we increase access. But I, I also didn't want to forget about, you know, some of the well-being of, of these teams where their workload is increasing. I think it also raises a question that you asked, said you were going to ask here, like, what, what did you hear from the teams? <laughs> yeah. what were, what, what, did what you did hear anything say? from the teams? Did you have access to any information? How, what was their perception of this experience? Oh, I just got pointed out. Okay. Um, so we did hear from the teams. We spoke to them before, um, you know, as part of the lead into the trial and targeted the hospital's uh, teams before it, they went live at their inner, you know, their hospital to give them extra airtime. Talked about things like pragmatic ways to manage volume, anticipated volume, gave them projections of volume based on enrollment that was going on in usual care, and just really did a lot of palliative care. We did a lot of listening. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, they were they were nervous. They were distressed. Ashwin and I was on the consult service last week at our busy hospital. And I, I do admit that sometimes I think like, I can't even imagine. <laughs> um, and, and yet, and yet, I, I think there's a, a tension in the field that if you can read a same number of articles that say, we are not seeing enough people and we're not seeing them early enough. We need to see we, who is out there. How do we get to them? And then when we do create these triggers that are imperfect, and those are the future directions I hope we talk about, that then we're like, whoa, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, and so there is a te- there's a tension there. And I totally agree with you that whether it's triage, a better trigger, a better, a different threshold, um, better identification of palliative care needs rather than diagnoses or prognoses um, and how we get at that, I think we have a lot of work to do, but um and I'm excited about that work, but I think conceptually, like we have to be okay that we do want to see the right people and we want to see them earlier. And we don't even know the universe of those people unless we start to systematically trigger and take out some of the biases that that are inherent to the usual care opt-in clinician. The Scott uh, example of like his myopic, Alex isn't going to get palliative care because he just doesn't think about it the same way as had you just been fortunate to get Kate as your ICU doctor the next mm-hmm. day. Yeah. You lost the lottery, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got a question because I, I want to save time for next steps. Um, yeah. Scott, I'm going to turn to for you in this one. Uh, big picture. We started off with you want to run a trial in a world where you can't randomize people to palliative care or not to see whether or not palliative care does anything based on the results you got negative length of stay, some other positive secondary outcomes. What do we know? Like, can we answer the question, does palliative care do anything based yeah. on this study? Yeah, I think you're, you're sort of uh, like eye roll at secondary outcomes aside um, <laughs> that, that we can actually stay alive. Dang the video. <laughs> <laughs> Just go back to audio days, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, Ashwin brought up the uh, the complier average treatment effect analysis this is an unbiased way of saying that when inpatient palliative care teams see patients who are 65 and older with one of those three diseases in this health system, which is the largest nonprofit health system in the country, by the way, so it's a pretty generalizable thing. 
But with those caveats, yeah, we can say that length of stay is reduced. We can also say that among all comers who are going to get a palliative care consult, those who get it by default, get it sooner and more often. And we can say that getting palliative care does not change your odds of dying in the hospital, which is important to a lot of people. And yet it does increase the odds that you're going to be discharged to hospice care, which those two things together, no increase in mortality, but increase in hospice utilization. It doesn't prove that that palliative care is goal concordant, but it's certainly suggestive. Okay, Kate, I got a lightning question for you because we're getting close. I want to future directions before we do that. So you're a pulmonary critical care doctor, right? And palliative care doctor. And palliative care, but pulmonary critical care. I am. (laughs) Is there a a, a 15,000 person pulmonary critical care uh, study showing that there's benefits of pulmonary consultations? (laughs) And why is palliative care any different? (laughs) Or cardiology or nephrology? Yeah. Um, I don't know if this was meant to be a softball, but you're like needling me. At, uh, <laughs> I, I was that really it was not meant to be softball. Me. It, was <laughs> <laughs> it, it no, goes it to the totally, heart of why we run yes. these studies. Yes, it totally bothers me that somehow we as a field in palliative care are held to the standard to even prove that we should exist in our value. Um, I, I mean, Diane Meyer and others are better to sort of get at the history of that and, and the why and, and what. But but I think just looking at it on its face, I think it's crap. <laughs> but but um, the trial, as I think Scott articulated well, is that not only did we intend to, to yes, show that because it seems we need to for health systems to invest in IN, but also to answer that question about when delivered, which we had to create separation between the groups in order to answer that question in a large, generalizable, pragmatic way. Um, and, and so I think we accomplished both yeah. goals um, with its limitations in mind. Yeah. We, we should have, listeners could have a drinking game with this broadcast. Every time they say we say pragmatic. You have to take it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay, uh, lightning round next steps. Unless, Ashwin, you have another question because I want to talk about next steps. Uh, each of you, one thought, you can maybe have two, but one or two thoughts as far as next steps. Kate, I'm going to start with you. Uh, my passion project is to um, do a better job at identifying patients who should be enrolled in these trials that are likely to benefit from palliative care, whether that's prognostic, whether it's palliative care needs, but um, we got to we gotta have better predictive enrichment. Um, and I think that'll get at a number of uh, limitations and problems we've talked about. Great. Scott? My passion project uh, that Kate and other members of the Care Center are working actively on is to figure out what outcome measures we can actually use in our next generation, Mm. uh, big, pragmatic drink, uh, (laughs) palliative (laughs) care. Because I heard you promised never to use length of stay. It will not be length of stay. We'd love to, everyone and their mother wants to use goal concordant care, but you know, newsflash, we don't have a good way of measuring that. Yeah. Yeah. But we we can we may I mean we're in the world of large language models. We we may be able to get there. So let's get there. Um let's look at other innovative outcomes that that we can all agree matter to all stakeholders and are uh measured without selection effects. Like uh, no offense to the other study that that you know you you discussed in the in the week before, but like there are big problems measuring patient reported outcomes. Mm-hmm. The missingness is not at random and you're never going to have a hundred percent capture of any patient reported outcome. So we all want patient reported outcomes. Kate and I do too, but that's a big problem as a primary outcome measure. Can I ask one, one last thing um, is Kate, you know, when I think about like the Jennifer Tamel study, we talked about this in the last podcast. I love the study, but I actually loved, the follow-up studies of that study more, like yeah, what is the question I was going to ask? Right, um, are you going to look at that because like cost wasn't talked about this and this? Your is there a qualitative study and what the teams thought about this? Right, are those right. things happening too? 
Yeah. And if not, can um, we ask for it? <laughs> Yeah, you you can ask. Um, we have several <laughs> um, secondary studies going on, many planned, many that generated or came out of hypothesis generation from some of what we were seeing um, as it happened and then seeing yeah. um, as results. Some are doable with our data and some are not. Um, cost? Cost so savings? Working on it. Working on it. Great. Cool. Great. We look forward to those. Well, uh, thank you both. But before we end... I think uh, we're going to go back to fish. A little fish. You're smiling at me In your picture frame And I miss you Life keeps on changing, but you stay the same, and I miss you. So many moments that we should have shared, and I miss you. And the day has turned to years, and it hasn't stopped yet. The memories we shared I will never forget Okay, Scott, the real reason you picked that song, I know why, because you missed being on the Jerry Pell podcast and you're excited. To go <laughs> Is that right? Got it. Got it. Well, I love uh, that thank song. You. Thank you. Great choice. Kate, Scott, thanks thank for you, being Alex. on the Jerry Pell podcast. And thank you for all of our listeners for your continued support. And we'd also like to thank all of our listeners who've donated more than $250, including... Dwayne Dobschutz, Frisch Brandt, My Lasting Letters, Kelly Strait, Daryl Owens, Roseanne Leipzig, Elizabeth Chung, Emise Shimoji, Harry Hahn, Nick Schneeman, Ed Martin, Jeff and Lena Galbraith, Himashu Mahotra, Nina Flanagan, Penelope Thompson, Lloyd Wolstadt, Mark Wren, Carol Heyman, Bob Rixey, Patrick Lally, Annie Hargadon, Susan Nelson, and Sharon Brangman. Thank you all.